more so than for a long time, transatlantic elites or ruling classes became aware of themselves as elites, yeah. right? They suddenly said, oh, wow, there's like genuine political opposition to the post-Cold War project. Politics came back with figures like Trump and, and Brexit. Center right and center left elite suddenly started looking around and were like, hey, actually, we agree on a lot more among ourselves than we do with the Trump base. And that there is genuine class conflict that has returned to the stage of world history. And we better win this because our material interests are at stake. Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Saurabh Amari. Saurabh is an American writer, editor and author. His journalism has been published in numerous outlets, including The Wall Street Journal, The New Republic and First Things. He was previously the opinion editor at the New York Post, and he is now a founder and an editor of the new magazine, Compact, which aims to challenge the overclass that controls government, culture, and capital. Saurabh has written numerous books, including The New Philistines, From Fire by Water, My Journey to the Catholic Faith, and The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos. So, Saurabh, let's talk about Hunter Biden's laptop. You know we live in a weird world when you have a podcast about the laptop of the son of the President of the United States, but there we are. Um, this, I think this is an incredibly important story for so many different reasons in terms of what it tells us about the political class, the political systems we live under, the power of big tech, the crisis of press freedom. So many things are interweaved with this one strange story. Uh, so let's dig down into a li into it a little bit. You're obviously involved in this story because when you were at the New York Post in 2020, you guys published this story of Hunter Biden's laptop being left in a repair shop and containing lots of sordid, interesting information about how he uses his name and what he gets up to and, and what kinds of relationships he has struck up. A very interesting story, a public interest matter. But of course, it was completely ignored. It was downplayed. It was even censored. And the reason it's back in the news now is because the New York Times has finally, in its gracious wisdom, authenticated the laptop. And I saw that the Babylon Bee did a, a headline saying, uh, New York Times authenticates the Watergate recordings, uh, which I thought was a very good summary of the bizarreness of this whole situation. So take us back to the beginning a little bit when you guys published this story in 2020 and the kind of response you got when you did that. Well, thanks for having me, Brendan. I should begin with this, that I was not part of the reporting or editing team that worked on the Hunter laptop story. What I did do at the time was I was heading up the op-ed pages. I was a comment editor at the New York Post. And so I saw the story the same time as everyone else. Mm -hmm. I woke up that morning. I typically check the news. And obviously, I go to our own page at the time. I'm no longer with the Post, but I would go to our own page and um, look at what the Post was leading with. And I saw this incredible story about um, Hunter apparently arranging meetings between a Ukrainian energy firm that was paying him upwards of $80,000 um, a month uh, at, to be on its board, despite Hunter having no specific energy expertise on the one hand, and his own father, who was then the second most powerful man in the world and the Obama administration's point man on Ukraine. So I thought, wow, that's first of all a slam dunk story. And what I noticed, and this is very important for understanding how these things transpired, Brendan, is that the post was very transparent about how we had come about this laptop. Mm. You remember in the four years prior, there had been lots of stories um, against Donald Trump, which the press should do. You should, obviously, the press is adversarial. They were critical of President Trump, but if you looked at the sourcing, it would be something like a senior official whose mom was related to another senior official who blah, 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 um, <laughs> right? It's a kind of very attenuated background sourcing. Whereas we said, look, from the beginning, the Post at the time said, Hunter Biden left this at a laptop repair shop. The owner of that shop noticed 
there was like obscene material on it. So he turned it over to the FBI. But before he did so, he also made a copy. And because he was a Republican, he gave it to the Trump camp. And so we were very transparent about the fact that this was partisan sourced. Yeah. And we were trusted our readers to take that into account and then judge the other material, the totality of material together and make their own determination about the veracity of the story. That was more transparent, I, I insist, than a lot of other stories, like I had said, that had appeared in the, in the blue check press, let's say, over the preceding four years. Okay, there we go. None of those earlier stories with their attenuated sourcing had been banned by social media or had had the outlets account uh, suspended on social media, anything like that. This one, however, at 10 in the morning, it's etched in my mind, a Facebook staffer, first of all, uh, released a statement saying, I've seen that disturbing New York Post story. And what I can tell you is that we're reducing circulation on it pending fact checking. Now, this Facebook staffer, as it happens, had spent a previous life working as a staffer for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and for Senator Barbara Boxer, Democrat of California. No shame about doing that. And then a couple, maybe an hour later, that story, the story was banned from being shared on, on Twitter as well. Not only could you not share it on your public feed, but I couldn't direct message it to you, Brendan. It was banned that way too. It's the most chilling thing I've ever seen. Mm. And here we are now. Right. In, in those intervening week, weeks, uh, Twitter also suspended the account of the New York Post, which uh, is the oldest continuously published daily newspaper in the United States. It was founded by Alexander Hamilton, one of our founding fathers. We stuck to our guns. We refused to accept the explanations for the ban by Twitter. They wanted us to say that it was hacked material. We insisted it's not hacked material. And they wanted us to just delete it at one point and repost it after they changed their rules on disclosing hack material. But we wouldn't do that because we insisted that it wasn't hack material to begin with. At the time, every single blue check prestige media outlet said that this was Russian disinformation. Mm -hmm. And then 50 former U.S. intelligence officials signed a letter claiming that this was uh, Russian disinformation material. They granted, they conceded that they had no ev evidence that this was Russian disinformation. Nevertheless, they went on. It bears all the indicia or all the hallmarks of, of a Russian information operation. What did the press do when those 50 intelligence officials do? Well, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to say, okay, a spy says this, right? Someone who, can, who has the power to drone people out of the sky, <laughs> right? press is supposed to an have an adversarial relationship with intelligence agencies, which, is our, which are unquestionably the most unaccountable elements of American national power. They did not do any of those things, though. They did not do their own reporting. They just served as stenographers for the big deep state intelligence guys. And they sort of repeated the line that this is Russian disinformation. The rest is history, right? Two years later, fast forward to today, and the New York Times verified what the New York Post reported fair and square two years ago, that th this information is authentic. One last bit of... Um, detail and I'll stop, I promise. What was the easiest way for Hunter Biden or the Biden camp to refute this story and make it go away and make the New York Post look terrible? They could have just said, not our emails, not our laptop, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. These are not authentic. This was not Hunter's laptop. Did they ever do that? No. Have they done that in the two years since? No. The Biden camp has never said these emails are fake and has never said that laptop doesn't definitively belong to by Hunter Biden. In fact, Hunter gave a t network TV interview in which he said very coyly, well, it could be mine. I mean, it is an extraordinary story in so many ways. And in some ways, the most extraordinary thing about it is that it didn't become a story. And in some ways, it still isn't becoming the story I think it ought to be. I mean, there are still media outlets that are either ignoring it. I mean, the New York Times has now verified, has now done what the New York Post did a year and a half ago and has verified that the laptop is real and interesting and ought to be considered. 
the Washington Post has done a kind of an apology. Well, not an apology, but it's done uh, this piece where it says we still had good reason not to look into this story at the time. It was questionable and therefore we were right to kind of ignore it when we ignored it. So it's this really extraordinary state of affairs. And if we just go back to that time when the New York Post was running with this story and big tech responded in that extraordinary way that you've just described. Of course, this was in the run up to the presidential election. Biden wanted to win. Trump looked like he was going to lose. And of course, the entire media elite virtually wanted Trump to lose. They had a vested interest in Trump losing. So how much of this was simply political? How much of this was the media and the big tech overlords clubbing together to ensure that there wouldn't be open criticism, open debate about one of the candidates in the presidential election, i.e. Joe Biden, and essentially protecting him from the questioning of, as you say, the oldest continuously published newspaper in the United States, the New York Post. Was, was this a case of the media elites and the big tech elite clubbing together to protect Joe Biden from media scrutiny in the run-up to the election? I mean, the most innocent explanation but I don't accept it, but I'm going to lay it out for you. The most innocent explanation is that after 2016, the big tech companies, and especially Facebook, even more so than Twitter, came under pressure to suppress damaging, quote unquote, disinformation. And therefore, they were hyper vigilant this time around, such that when this story came out, they acted in an egregious way. Now, I reject that premise, the premise that they they allowed disinformation to... Um, distort the outcome of the 2016 election four years earlier between Trump and Hillary, and therefore it made them overcautious and overcorrecting in 2020. Because the idea that Trump won because of some stupid Russian memes is insulting to the intelligence of the American people. Yes, the Russians did put out some memes of like our Lord Jesus Christ putting his arms around Trump and um, the devil putting her, his arms around Clinton, right? That's not why Clinton lost. Clinton lost because she was a historically unpopular figure who didn't campaign in key Midwestern states where American elections are won and lost. That's why she lost the election. And the notion that popular democratic outcomes, when liberal elites don't like those outcomes, when our ruling class doesn't like certain outcomes, it must be because some nefarious foreign force duped people. There is mass millions of people became hypnotized by the Kremlin is absurd, it's wrong, and it's a way for uh, the ruling class to essentially shirk responsibility. Why did people become so dissatisfied with the status quo that they were willing to take a chance on this kind of buffoonish reality TV figure? They don't want to answer that question because the answer would be an indictment of the ruling class. So instead, they have to blame foreign forces, the Kremlin, the this, the that, for why they lost. And also, and I think we've discussed this on this show before, it also applies to Brexit yeah, because they tried to pull the same thing in response to Brexit. Why did Brexit overcome uh, remain in 2000, summer of 2016? It wasn't that the sort of EU arrangements weren't working out for working class Britons. <laughs> it was because collusion and Russia and mm-hmm. Putin, et cetera. So I reject the premise, but that's the innocent explanation. The less innocent explanation, which is, I think, the correct one and a home run, is that, yes, we have a ruling class and its power does not lie in government alone. In fact, much of its power is private power, which is why it's so sinister. It's corporate power. It's the power of tech companies. It's the power of NGOs that are supposedly defenders, watchdogs of democracy, but in fact, are funded by certain billionaires and protected those billionaires' material interests. That's what happened. The fact that the people uh, announcing, at least on Facebook's part, why they were doing the censorship were democratic operatives, and they didn't even feel any shame about doing that, um, just shows you how naked a partisan exercise this was, that all the kind of real elements of national power, the intelligence apparatus, Silicon Valley, large media corporations, privately owned corporations, and of course the Democratic Party joined together to suppress a story that was damaging to their preferred presidential candidate. 
You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. If you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. With most providers like iTunes or Spotify, it's really easy to do with just one click. And if you get this show via YouTube, then make sure you not only subscribe to Spike's YouTube channel, but that you also click the bell so that you are alerted to every new episode. One of the things that is is really shocking about this, I mean, there are too many to go into, but one of them is the almost the institutionalized incuriosity of, of the rest of the media. So you had the behavior of big tech, which I think is incredibly sinister, that um, deployment of corporate power to prevent the sharing of a particular story, to block the editors of a particular newspaper from accessing their Twitter account. I mean, just a brute deployment of corporate power to the end of restricting media access and media debate, which is deeply chilling. Uh, But alongside that, you had the rest of the media who ignored the story. And for the reasons I think you're absolutely right that you've just outlined, that they were absolutely determined that their preferred candidate would win the election and that nothing would scupper that that outcome. But just even at that level, it still remains a quite alarming scenario that there was so little curiosity in the media about a fascinating story, a laptop left in a repair shop belonging to the wayward son of the presidential candidate, full of spicy information. I mean, any journalist worth his or her salt would want to be at least to know more about that issue. But there was just no curiosity at all. And in fact, You had people at CNN and National Public Radio openly saying, we're not going to waste our time on this. We can't be bothered. It's ridiculous. It's a setup. It's fake news. It's Russian disinformation. The same people, by the way, who very often shared the most outlandish stories about um, Trump doing things with prostitutes, or I can't even remember the stories that were put out about Trump and, and, tapes, and you know, all the crazy japes that Trump allegedly got up to. So is it simply that the media has been hyper-politicized and has become incredibly woke and is now partisan? I mean, media outlets have always been partisan, and there's not really a problem with that so long as it's clear that what they are. But they've become so corrupted by... Uh, ideological concerns that they've absolutely pushed aside even the basic first job of the journalist, which is to be curious about information. Yes. Yes, they have. I mean, that's a, I I have nothing to disagree (laughs) with what you laid out there. I mean, one economic factor is the shift from um, print advertising, which has been declining for years and years towards subscription-based models. You know, when the New York Times was not just subscription based but could draw a significant income from print advertising it could it could afford to be more of a truly national paper a national paper represents all points of view or tries to represent major points of view and have that curiosity that you're talking about or uh, celebrating a paper that narrowly ad- uh, addresses itself to a a narrow part of society or a narrow slice of society of, of um you know, coastal urban elites, professional managerial types, and the people they work for doesn't have to be nationally representative and curious in a truly national and broad way. In fact, it has every incentive to to try to meet the ideological um, perspectives and demands of its subs- subscriber base. Um, and that's a tendency toward ever narrower mindsets, uh, which is very, I think it's poison for for the enterprise of journalism rightly understood, as I think you agree, Brendan. So that's one factor. It's it's very important to understand. It's a kind of question of political economy. And the other factor is, I, again, I think we've talked about this on the show before, that somehow in 2015, 16, more so than for a long time, transatlantic elites or ruling classes became aware of themselves as elites, yeah. right? They suddenly said, oh, wow, there's like genuine political opposition to the post-Cold War project of um, ever more liberation, both economic, sexual, you can imagine that's a borderless, borderless world. They got real like, real political pushback. Politics came back with figures like Trump and, and Brexit. Um, and such that center right and center left elite suddenly started looking around and were like, hey, actually, we agree on a lot more among ourselves than we do with the Trump base. And that there is genuine class conflict that is that has returned to the stage of world history. And 
we better win this because our material interests are at stake and we're going to we're going to be pretty pretty hard nosed pretty aggressive about winning that so those two factors i think combined to produce the result that we witnessed Yes, and a, a very similar dynamic took place in the UK, as you say, after the vote for Brexit, where suddenly you had a the rebirth of self-consciousness amongst the elite. And, and what they did essentially was push aside, you know, the rather pantomime politics that ex- had existed between them for quite a few decades, where, uh, you know, a pretty phony left and a pretty phony right, which is what politics had been reduced to, and suddenly realize, actually, we have a lot in common, primarily keeping at bay these armies of gammon, these kind of underclass, working class people who are against the European Union, who stupidly think they should have the right to determine the fate of the nation, whose cultural values are obnoxious and abhorrent and and deserving of ridicule. You know, let's club together and define ourselves against them. And that is what they have been doing for the past six years in a pretty explicit way. And I think there's a very similar dynamic in the US, as, as you describe. But one thing I wanted to ask you just another one more question on is in relation to big tech, because this is something you've spoken about and written about very well over the past few years. I think it's something that I think people don't recognize how important and concerning the power of big big tech is. And the way I see it in relation to the Hunter Biden story is if these overlords of the internet, which is, you know, the 21st century public square, it's where you go if you want to be political, you want to engage in discussion, you want to connect with people. This is, you have to go to these places. You don't really have a great deal of choice. And if the people who are the overlords of those places can punish a respectable newspaper for telling a story that was true, then you think, what else can they do? I mean, that is a power that is limitless, and that is an arrogance that is really off the scale and and a, a kind of a, a, a complete lack of shame about the deployment of power to such uh, political ends. So what do you think can be done about that? What do you, do you think can be done to rein in those unaccountable billionaires who have an extraordinary amount of power, not only over the New York Post, which is outrageous, but over me and you and millions of people? In, uh, look at the Babylon Bee currently uh, has been frozen out of sharing its content on Twitter, despite the fact that it has millions of readers, because it, it hilariously gave Rachel Levine the Man of the Year award, which is absolutely brilliant and fun. Money and obviously biting satire. Now it's been frozen out by the overlords for having done that. What can be done to temper the power of these institutions, do you think? So here, I, I might surprise your, your listeners who, who know me and associate me with the right. I can't help but plug in this, this magazine I just happened to have launched today called Compact. But um, I think there has to be an alliance of people on the right and what exists of the old social democratic left that saw that the economy is not this neutral zone of mere market exchange come what may that of course we have a political economy and what that means is that it it is bound up with how we organize our societies it it is fundamental to how we organize our society. And therefore, various economic forces, technological and economic forces that have been treated as apolitical and therefore not subject to democra- the normal kind of consensual democratic give and take of societies that call themselves democracies or democratic republics must be, those zones of life must be brought back under political, I don't want to say supervision, but political, subjected to political give and take which we accept in other realms of, of life, but we've said, no, 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 but this is a private zone and therefore it's not, it's not justiciable. The grievances you have in this private zone are not justiciable. The, they are not subject to democratic give and take. They cannot be politicized. And then you have kind of, this is a tendency of neoliberalism to expand the private zones of society such that ever more of life is not subject to the democratic give and take. That's very dangerous. That's where you get to the point where you have a situation of potential total control, right? It's not just that big tech can censor you and me or censor the Babylon Bee, but in addition, you could have uh, central bank digital currencies, which are being proposed now to sort of transform um, fiat money as one of our contributors 
Alex Gutentag writes in, in our opening issue, the title of the piece is about provocatively, the Great Reset is real, that they are going to use currencies to get rid of fiat currencies as we know it and have these kind of tokens that can be turned on or off depending on your good behavior. We saw some really creepy experiments under the pretense of, of combating COVID the past two years. COVID has now become, has maybe outlived its uselessness for the ruling class, but those mechanisms, they learned something about what they could do. And note how much of these control mechanisms are private, right? It's, it's not the government doing it. It's your bank. I'm sorry, your bank just doesn't want to platform you as a pro-gun organization in the United States or a, or a gender critical feminist. I'm sorry, but, um, you know, we don't, we don't rent to people with these views in our, in this housing complex owned by the largest hedge fund in the world, BlackRock. You know, I'm just kind of giving examples of what they could do. So to answer your question, sorry, long with an answer, but we have to repoliticize the economy, not pretend like the economy and politics are these o- autonomous l- realms that don't contour each other. I, I agree with that. And I think the rising power of private corporate organizations to interfere with our lives politically is is becoming in- terrifying. I mean, there's the case of the Canadian truckers, for example, where banks froze their assets or refused to allow them to access their money and where online outlets refused to give them that money that had been donated by ordinary working people who wanted to support the truckers. I mean, these are very clear examples of private institutions using their power to deprive people, in that case, of the right to protest and the right to offer solidarity to fellow working people. An extraordinary interference by wealthy private individuals into the lives of ordinary people. And uh, of course, in relation to social media, one of the things that I find very chilling, and I I know this is a simple point, is the fact that these social media outlets, these social media oligarchs can censor us for saying things that are legal to say in the countries we live in. So in the UK, for example, it is still legal at the moment, thank God, to say that Someone with a penis is a man, not a woman. But if you were to say that in certain situations on social media, you could be deprived of a platform. So they are acting over and above the democratic rights we enjoy in the nations that we live in. And that seems to me to be an intolerable interference in democratic public life. Um, Okay, so you mentioned your new magazine, Compact, which looks brilliant. It's been launched. I've I've seen, uh, I've looked at it and it looks fantastic. And the writers you have look incredibly interesting. So tell us a bit more about it. I was intrigued by you, you guys, your description of the magazine. There was one sentence in particular that really whetted my appetite where you said, Compact will challenge the overclass that controls government, culture, and capital. You go on to say, whoever does this is bound to be called radical. We do not shy away from the label, but we insist on its proper meaning. And I love this bit because I've long been insisting on the proper meaning of radical, which is not to be necessarily an extremist, but it means to get to the root of things. To be radical means to chop at the root of things, to understand the root of things. So that's clearly the mission statement of Compact. Why did you think that was necessary now? And what aspirations do you have for Compact? Sure. So there are three of us, of of the co-founders of the magazine. Two of us come from the traditional world of the right. Matthew Schmitz and I are Catholics, we're conservative, or traditionally been identified with uh, the conservative movement, but are disillusioned in some ways. And our third founder, Edwin Aponte, um, launched a magazine on his own, which was a voice of, of, of the left. He's a Marxist. Um, but he also became disillusioned with the existing left. And what we realized is that uh, much of the exist, not all of it, but much of the existing left and right are in some ways two wings of the professional managerial class and big capital. They seem to ferociously combat each other, but really both are characterized by this inattention to material reality, which is what shapes culture. So they fight ferociously at the level of culture. The, the, the right is against certain things culturally, the left is for them, etc. And they don't pay attention to how culture really is born out of um, class relations in society and material reality. So we join together to make a compact, a, a magazine that takes seriously, not just culture, but material reality, not just ideology, but, but class relations as well. And in doing so, we've tried to also give journalistic 
institutionalization to this un- informal alliance that's been happening already between people of left and right who reject the kind of overclass consensus on things like COVID, on things like immigration, on things like you know wages and unionization and so forth. And who are these people? If you've noticed, this is certainly the case for me, which has shocked me. 10 years ago, I used to butt heads all the time with Glenn Greenwald, <laughs> right? Over the war on terror, over the surveillance state. I now know myself, but also people who worked in the Trump administration, I kid you not, who tell me, I wish I could go back to my younger self a decade ago and tell myself, you know what? Glenn Greenwald has a point (laughs) about the war on terror. Glenn Greenwald has a point on big tech monopolies. And that's, that's been happening informally on the internet where people who didn't think they would agree with each other ever are, (laughs) are now in the trenches against this blob, whatever it is that we're (laughs) facing. Um, and this magazine tries to give an institutional home to that. As it happens, Glenn Greenwald is one of our contributing editors. We have definitely people associated with the right, like Patrick Deneen and, and Adrian Vermeule, but also Ashley Frawley, uh, the Marxist writer, Alex Gutentag, uh, these people who don't fit in neatly into any of these boxes. And it's not that we're trying to transcend these labels, but to maybe think of them as more ir- irrelevant even and just see okay, what is what are the real oppositions? What is the world really like and how can we how can we make it more humane? How yeah. can we make it more fair? How can we make it more democratic? And just finally, the name of the magazine. I mean, the design of the magazine is fantastic. I said, I said to you before we came on, to me, it looks kind of 1970s. I think it might look a bit more 1960s to other people. It has a classical look and the title, Compact. And as you point out, as you guys point out, uh, a compact is not a contract, it's not a covenant, it's not a market relation. A compact is a political union that draws together uh, different people towards a common end. And as you've just outlined there, I think that's probably where the most promising politics is going to come from in the next few years, because the old right has lost its way. The old left has lost its way for a very, very long time. I think libertarians are not cut out at all for the new era, particularly the increasing power of private corporations and their adherence to the idea that private organizations can do what they want because private property rights, et cetera, et cetera, means they're not really cut out for the arguments we need to be having. The left has sold its soul and abandoned the working classes in favor of identitarianism and an increasingly ever shrinking circle of identity groups. So on all sides, plots have been lost and principles have been ditched. And you guys see it an opportunity, I guess, to create a compact between people who are united by a commitment to democratic values, to material reality, and to, I guess, raising the level of public discussion. Absolutely. At the same time, though, we're, we're very clear that we, you know, there is a tendency to be like, can't we all, can't the left and right come together <laughs> and like meet somewhere in the middle? That's not who we are. We have like, <laughs> you know, we have sharp critiques and we have some disagreements among each other that may be irreconcilable. But as you say, there are common ends that we share and we see that kind of organic alliance happening already, but it needs a sort of serious journalistic home. And we're, we're proud to be that and look forward to seeing where it goes. Sorab, thank you very much. Thank you, Brendan. It's always good to see you. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.